Imagine a world where giants roamed the earth. Creatures so massive, so powerful, they're almost beyond belief. Welcome to a time when the planet was ruled by the ancient beasts. Today, we're embarking on a two-hour journey through the prehistoric past. Prepare to be amazed as we uncover the mind-blowing facts about these extraordinary creatures. From the fearsome bear dogs to the gentle giants of the sea, we'll explore their lives, habitats, and the secrets they hold. So, sit back, relax, and let's dive into the world of the ancient animals. How could a bear be the size of a dinosaur? It sounds impossible, doesn't it? But it's true. Arctotherium angustidens, or the beast bear, was as large as the Allosaurus, and with that insane size, it was one of the most ferocious land predators to ever exist. In fact, it's now debated if it should be crowned the true king of all land predators. So, stay tuned as we dive into the extraordinary life of this ancient beast. Starting with its appearance, Arctotherium probably looked a lot like today's spectacle bear. It had a big body, a somewhat short snout, and round ears. But the short snout might just look that way because its face was deep, not because it was actually short. These bears had medium-sized jaws and teeth, suggesting they ate both meat and plants. That's different from herbivorous bears, which have short jaws and big cheek teeth, and carnivorous bears, which have the opposite. Now, Arctotherium angustidens is one of the five Arctotherium species. Four of the five species were similar in size to modern-day bears, weighing up to 880 pounds or 400 kilograms. However, the giant short-faced bear, Arctotherium angustidens, is the largest documented bear ever. One fossil suggested it could weigh up to 4,500 pounds or 2,040 kilograms, standing up to 14 feet or 4.2 meters tall on its hind legs. That means it was taller than both an average T-Rex and an African bush elephant when it stood upright. In a comparison of its weight, the largest polar bear ever recorded weighed about 2,200 pounds or 997 kilograms. Another shocking fact about these bears is that their arms were three times longer than a human's. That said, its scientific name Arctotherium means bear beast in Greek, perfectly describing its enormous size. But how did it grow so big? Well, the source behind Arctotherium's gigantism is believed to be the extinction of Chapel Melania, which was a highly specialized omnivore with a diet similar to modern bears. With Chapel Melania gone, intense competition for resources may have eased, allowing Arctotherium to rapidly increase in size. This allowed it to become the largest predator during the early Pliocene and early Pleistocene periods. Now, scientists haven't extensively studied this bear's behavior, but it's believed to have behaved similarly to modern bears, so it likely lived solitarily except during breeding seasons and preferred caves or dens as habitats, possibly hibernating in winters in certain regions. Mothers gave birth to a few cubs after a gestation period lasting approximately six to nine months, and communication among these bears likely involved grunts, chuffing, and snorting. You'll be surprised to know that despite its massive size, Arctotherium angustidens was pretty efficient in catching prey, thanks to its proportionally long legs that made it possible for it to reach crazy high speeds. It could potentially cross 40 meters or 60 kilometers per hour, similar to a grizzly bear, despite being significantly heavier. Apart from that, it had a strong sense of smell as indicated by the structure of its skull. It is believed that it could detect scents over multiple miles or kilometers, which was pretty handy when it needed to locate and catch prey. Arctotherium was found primarily in Argentina, with possible occurrences in El Salvador and Bolivia. Specimens indicate that this giant bear preferred open plains, but also ventured into forested areas. Rare finds also suggest that Arctotherium occasionally inhabited paleo burrows, where multiple bodies have been discovered. But one thing is clear, while Arctotherium certainly had a love for burrows, it likely didn't create them. Instead, it is believed to have conquered burrows dug by various other animals. These played a significant role in the bear's life, serving as shelter and, potentially, a source of conflict. Competition for burrows among individuals was pretty common, leading to battles and takeovers. And this intense competition likely contributed to an increase in the number of paleo burrows during the early Paleocene, as Arctotherium forced other animals to regularly evacuate or face potential conflict. So, being the big bully it was, what did it prey on? 
Well, these bears had an omnivorous diet, though the specific foods varied among species. The giant short-faced bear ate plant matter, but primarily preyed on large animals like giant ground sloths, camels, tapirs, ancient relatives of elephants, and glyptodonts, or giant armadillos. Fossil evidence of broken teeth suggests it also gnawed on bones, possibly as a scavenger rather than an active hunter, due to competition with agile predators like saber-toothed cats. Its size and strength allowed it to intimidate and even chase away these competitors from kills. The other four Octotherium species probably leaned more towards fruit and leaves than meat, spending much of their time foraging for vegetation. Competition with predators may have led to their shift towards a more herbivorous diet over time. But who could possibly dare to threaten this beast? Adult Octotherium likely faced few consistent predators due to its massive size and ferocity. But injuries on fossils suggest it likely fought with other big animals often. The only predator big enough to rival it back then would have been a Smilodon populator, but its cubs may have been at risk from other big cats and birds of prey. Now let's look into some of the most similar animals to this bear. Octotherium belongs to a group of bears called the Tremarctinae, known for their short faces. While we'll dive into its family tree in more detail later in this video, for now you should know that the other main bear groups are the pandas, Iluropodinae, and modern bears, Yersinae which include grizzly and black bears. Within the Tremarctinae, there are three major groups. The first one is the spectacled bear, Tremarctos. This is the only surviving member of the short-faced bears. The Florida short-faced bear, another member of this group, went extinct around 11,000 years ago. Spectacled bears are characterized by their short snouts, black bodies, and distinctive white and ginger markings. They are considered vulnerable and are found along the Andean mountain range. The second one is Octodus. This was the North American equivalent of Octotherium, a massive short-faced bear weighing up to 2,100 pounds and standing up to 10 feet tall on its hind legs. They primarily preyed on large animals like deer and mammoths, but likely also ate plants. Octodus may have been more of a scavenger than an active predator. And the third bear group is known as Pleonoctus. Now this is the oldest member of the short-faced bears, dating back 10 million to 3 million years ago. It is possibly an ancestor of other short-faced bears, but little is known about it. Pleonoctus was likely similar in size to the spectacled bear. Now that you know which animals it shares the most similarities with, let's roll the clock all the way back to when this bear was first discovered. The first fossil from the Octotherium genus was discovered way back in 1852, but it wasn't until 1880 that the genus was officially named by the German-Argentine zoologist Hermann Burmeister after fossils from Aeogustodons were found. Since then, many fossils from this genus have been uncovered. In 1935, during the construction of the San Juan de Dios Hospital in La Plata City near Buenos Aires, Argentina, a pair of arm bones and shoulder blades from the giant short-faced bear were found. It wasn't until 2011 that these bones were thoroughly studied for the first time. Dating back a million years, they belong to the largest bear ever found, as mentioned earlier. Since only the arm bones were found, scientists had to estimate the bear's total size. Interestingly, despite the attention given to the giant short-faced bear, fossils from A. wingi and A. torrigensa are much more common. This might suggest that they were the most successful species in the Octotherium genus. Let's look into their family and evolution some more. Octotherium belongs to the Tremarctinae subfamily of bears, also known as short-faced bears, which also includes Octodus, North American short-faced bears, and Tremarctus, the Floridian and modern spectacled bear. The common ancestor of these bears is Pleonoctus, dating back to around 10 million years ago in North America. Around 5 million years ago, there was a significant increase in diversity among Tremarctans and other bears due to changes in vegetation, climate, and fauna. Octotherium, Octodus, and Tremarctus likely diverged around 4.8 million years ago. The earliest confirmed remains of Octotherium in South America are from A. Augustidens, found in Buenos Aires, Argentina, dating between 1 to 0.7 million years ago during the Encenadan period. A. Augustidens became extinct around 700,000 years ago and was replaced by smaller species. Successor species like A. Vitustum, A. Beneriensa, A. Targensa, and A. wingae appeared during the middle to late Pleistocene, with A. wingae being the smallest but most widespread species. Within Octotherium, two clades are identified, A. bonariensa and A. togensa. 
Avenariensa and A. targensa are considered more derived, while A. vetustum and A. wingae are considered more primitive, but they are also the most successful in terms of temporal and geographic range and the frequency of fossil finds. Finally, as to what wiped these giant short-faced bears off the planet, they likely disappeared between 500,000 to 800,000 years ago. This could be because it had to compete with other top predators like jaguars, cougars and wolves. Other species of Arctotherium might have survived until about 10,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age. The last sightings of Arctotherium include one in Uruguay, about 36,900 or 14,485 years ago, another in Chile, around 10,345 years ago, and one in Mexico, approximately 12,850 years ago, with a possible sighting in Venezuela about 9,000 years ago. Interestingly, some Arctotherium remains were found alongside human remains in Mexico. The spectacled bear, Tromarctus, doesn't show up in South America's fossil records until much later, suggesting it came from North America after Arctotherium went extinct. It's possible that as modern spectacled bears moved southward, they might have mixed with Arctotherium. During a period called the Quaternary Extinction Event, species with simpler body shapes, like the Tromarctus bear, were more likely to survive. In the end, Arctotherium augustidens, the giant short-faced bear, was the largest land predator of its era. With speeds matching grizzly bears despite its larger size, it was a formidable hunter that even the big cats of its habitat feared. What's the most monstrous looking prehistoric animal you've ever seen? Is it a gigantic dinosaur? A massive sea creature like the Mosasaurus? Or perhaps someone from the cat family? Well, get ready to add another name to your list of scariest prehistoric animals. Because if the hell pigs aren't already on there, you just don't know enough about them. That, or you just haven't seen one up close. And man, you better thank God for that. But now it's time to meet the hell pigs. From their strange and terrifying biological makeup to their violent lives, this video will show you a side of pigs that you haven't seen yet. The hell pigs are easily one of Mother Nature's baddest and nastiest works. And they don't just come in one species, it's a whole gang of different species under the family Intelodontidae. But despite the name, they're not exactly pigs. Real pigs belong to a different family called Suidae. Hell pigs just look kinda piggy. As a matter of fact, some recent research even suggests they might have been more like hippos and whales than pigs. How bizarre! These intelodonts lived on Earth somewhere between 38 million to 19 million years ago. And here's what they looked like. If we're being polite, hell pigs weren't the most friendly looking creatures. One of the main things about them was their big skull with a long face. The Deodon species had skulls about 35 inches long, which is over half the length of an average man. They also had bony bumps on their lower jaws and some really big teeth in their mouths, kind of like what you see in today's meat eaters. Some of these guys were seriously massive. Deodon, for instance, was thought to weigh a staggering 900 kilograms, 1,984 pounds. That's as hefty as some of the biggest brown bears which suddenly seem a lot more cuddly when put next to an intelodont. Some of these dudes were a bit smaller, which might have made them a tad less nightmare-inducing. But even the smallest hell pigs still tipped the scales at around 150 kilograms, 331 pounds, so we wouldn't exactly call them lightweight. They were definitely on the heavy side, as they're often compared to oversized warthogs or wild boars. Their bodies followed the typical build of hooved animals, with short, sturdy legs built for endurance rather than speed. They had robust shoulders to support their massive heads, which were armed with powerful jaws filled with large molars, canines, and incisors. Their feet had cloven hooves, similar to those of pigs, adding to their tank-like appearance. This made them pretty intimidating, capable of using their weight to scare off smaller predators or even ramming small prey to keep them from getting away. But what really makes intelodonts stand out were their flanges and bony lumps on their faces. Early depictions showed them as lipless creatures with protruding flanges on the sides of their faces. Nowadays, reconstructions show them with full lips and wet noses, with the flanges supporting powerful jaw muscles. This gives them a more mammalian look, with full cheeks and lips. 
but standing over 1.8 meters tall and more than 2.4 meters in length, they still look pretty darn monstrous. These Terminator pigs had sturdy barrel-shaped bodies, featuring a prominent hump along their spine. This hump, probably made of fat like that seen in modern bison, might have acted as both an energy store and insulation during tough environmental times. But were these guys really as hellish as their name suggests? Oh yeah. Researchers have found what they call meat caches in Wyoming, which they think were made by hell pigs. They figured this out by matching up the bite marks with the measurements of their jaws. It seems these creatures had a gruesome dining style. They'd chop off the heads of their prey, then dig into the meaty back parts. After that, they'd stash away the leftover chest parts in these caches for a later snack. So not only were these hell pigs big and scary, but they were also pretty crafty, judging by their dining habits. We don't know about you, but we are definitely relieved there's no chance of bumping into one of these meat-eating, bone-crunching beasts while out on a hike. Now, those prehistoric times weren't short of terrifying creatures roaming around the floodplains of Nebraska or the steppes of Mongolia. Alongside entelodonts, you had nimravid saber-tooths and the infamous bear dogs, amphicyanids, prowling around as well. These top predators really set the tone for the food chains and the whole ecosystem back then. While entelodonts did hunt animals for food, recent research tells us that's not all they did. These pigs weren't just fierce meat eaters. While earlier studies proposed that entelodonts were opportunistic hunters of big plant eaters with teeth built for crunching bones like hyenas, new findings published this year challenge that idea. The study checked out the tiny wear marks on the teeth of Entelodon magnus, a species mainly existing in Europe. Turns out, those marks hinted at a diet that wasn't too picky. Kinda like wild boars, they probably ate roots and fruits, and maybe even scavenged for meat. But don't think they were all peace and love. Looking into Entelodon skulls showed scars from bites that had healed up, probably from scuffles with other Entelodonts. They were pretty feisty and territorial animals, who used their tusks and massive size to scare off or even hurt their rivals, making sure to guard their turf. When it came to clashes between entelodonts, it was likely all about showing who's boss. Each one would use their tusks and bony flanges to establish their spot in the pecking order. They probably also fought to secure access to food and mating opportunities. Even though entelodonts had the skills to hunt, their body setup and special features tell us they were mostly into scavenging. With their sharp sense of smell and wide-ranging eyesight, they could spot carcasses from far away. Their hefty size and muscle power probably came in handy for scaring off smaller predators and snagging themselves a meal. But how did these guys get around? Entelodonts had strong legs and hooves, good for getting around different places. They weren't built for super-fast running, but their sturdy limbs helped them support their big bodies so they could move around to find food or escape from enemies. These guys were adaptable eaters and scavengers, which means they could munch on all kinds of stuff. This flexible diet probably helped them thrive in their habitats during the Eocene and Oligocene epochs, making them a successful bunch of ancient mammals. Speaking of ancient mammals, let's trace these pigs' evolutionary journey and see where they really came from. About 38 million years back, Intelodonts kicked off their journey during the Eocene epoch, this marks the start of their evolutionary story, something researchers have been tracing since then. They belong to the extinct family Intelodontidae and the order Artiodactyla, which also includes modern pigs, peccaries, hippos, camels, and deer. People have different ideas about where Intelodonts fit in the mammal family tree. Everyone agrees they're in the same group as whales and hoofed mammals, like camels and hippos, but there's a debate about exactly where they belong in that group. Some scientists used to think pigs and peccaries were their closest relatives, but a study in 2009 suggested they're actually more like hippos, whales, and a carnivore called Andrusarchus. Now, while entelodonts aren't directly ancestors of today's pigs, they do share a common ancestry and some similarities in appearance. Their story begins in Asia, where they first popped up, and from there, their fossils spread across Europe and North America. Over time, these critters changed getting bigger and finding their place in different environments. Fossils dug up in various places and periods show a bunch of different species and groups, like Archaeotherium, Brachyhyops, 
Deodon and Intelodon, giving us a glimpse into the diversity of the Intelodon family. Compared to their later cousins, the early Intelodonts were pretty small, but as time went on and they evolved, they got bigger. They developed some useful features along the way, like strong jaws, long curved tusks, and these bony bits on their cheeks. These adaptations made Intelodonts awesome omnivores, munching on plants, bugs, and even dead animals. Throughout the Eocene and Oligocene epochs, Intelodonts spread out and thrived in all kinds of places, from forests to plains. But sadly, they bit the dust around 16 million years ago during the late Oligocene. What exactly wiped them out is still a mystery, but we have some clues. First off, climate change probably played a big part. Back then, the earth was cooling down and things were getting drier. Forests started shrinking and grasslands were spreading. This might have meant less food and water for hell pigs, making life pretty tough for them. On top of that, ecosystems were shifting. With the climate changing, the places where hell pigs lived were also changing. More grasslands meant different plants and animals around. Maybe not the stuff hell pigs were used to munching on. Plus, more competition for resources like food and water probably didn't help their chances of survival. Another reason hell pigs might have bitten the dust is because of increased competition. New predators like Hyenodon and other Creodonts were evolving. These guys were pros at hunting and scavenging, maybe even better than hell pigs. So now, these pigs had to fight harder just to get a bite to eat. Plus, as ecosystems changed, hell pigs might have struggled to keep up. They were big dudes with a taste for everything, but maybe that wasn't working out so well anymore. Smaller predators that were better at hunting for specific types of food could have had the upper hand, leaving the hell pigs with less to munch on. So, when you put it all together, it seems like a bunch of stuff teamed up against hell pigs, making life really tough for them. Climate change, ecosystem shifting, more competition, and their own size and eating habits probably all played a part. As conditions got worse, it could have been harder for hell pig populations to hang on. With fewer of them around, their genetic diversity may have taken a hit, making it even trickier for them to adapt to the changing world. While we can't say for sure what exactly pushed hell pigs over the edge, it's likely that all these factors working together contributed to their extinction in the end. To sum it up, Intelodonts, or the hell pigs, were fascinating creatures that roamed the Earth around 38 to 16 million years ago. They were part of the Arteodactyla order, like today's even-toed undulates, but they weren't direct ancestors of any living animals. These creatures had a pretty unique bunch of physical traits, including their large size, elongated heads, formidable jaws, curved tusks, and strange bony flanges on their cheeks. Such adaptations enabled them to thrive as omnivorous scavengers, feasting on a wide variety of food sources and occupying various ecological niches. Their behaviors and dietary preferences were well suited to the environments of their time. However, a combination of factors, including climate change, shifting ecosystems, and heightened competition with other predators, eventually led to their extinction during the late Oligocene Epoch. Studying these terrifying beasts helps us understand how life on Earth has changed over time and how animals adapt to their surroundings. If we roll the clock back 13,000 years and you find yourself in a face-off with this formidable beast, good night. The American lion was a giant pantherian cat that roamed the lands of North America during the Pleistocene Epoch. The species earned its scientific name, Panthera atrox, with the Latin word atrox meaning savage or cruel. And believe me when I say that name perfectly portrays its scary, predatory nature. These powerful cats can grow to twice the height of a person, and some can even weigh as much as a full-grown brown bear. You know what that makes them, the second largest land predator. Besides their size, lions are admired for their elegance and cleverness, which have helped them thrive in the open grasslands. And yet, none of them compare to how intelligent and majestic the American lion was. It was not only bigger than today's lions, but also the largest feline predator ever known to exist. Now, here's what I mean when I call it majestic. It measured up to 2.5 meters, 8 feet, 2 inches, from nose to tail base, and stood around 1.2 meters, 3.9 feet tall at the shoulder. But you're not ready for this next detail. 
they could stretch up to 12 feet tall on their hind legs. Man, that is massive. It's around the same size as an African elephant. However, just like their African relatives, these lions showed some big differences between males and females. The males were heavyweights, weighing around 523 kilograms, 1,153 pounds. And to put it into perspective, that means they could outweigh eight adult humans. The ladies were a bit lighter though, weighing about 365 kilograms, 805 pounds. Not exactly your average kittens. Now, let's talk bones. The American lion had some seriously sturdy limb bones, beefier even than those of African lions, more like what you'd find in a brown bear. Thanks to a bunch of fossils that were discovered at the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles, scientists have gotten a good handle on what these lions were all about. They were kind of like modern lions, but bigger, sort of like their cousins, the Eurasian cave lions and the Nato Dimeri lion from back in the day in Eastern Africa. Some skin remains have also been found in caves down in the Argentine Patagonia, suggesting that the American lion had a reddish coat, and cave paintings found in the Santa Cruz province of Argentina back that up. They actually show the lion with a similar reddish color. This helps tell them apart from other big predators like jaguars, which were painted with more of a yellowish hue in similar cave art. But just like the dire wolf, it turns out that the American lion wasn't actually a lion, Recent research has revealed that despite many similarities, these two cats are too different to belong to the same species. The American lion had a sturdy build, lacked a developed mane, had proportionally longer legs, and a uniquely shaped skull. While it still fell under the Panthera genus, its scientific name became Panthera atrox, acknowledging its ferocious demeanor and size. Some studies even questioned its closest relative, suggesting it might be the tiger or jaguar, However, DNA sequencing confirmed that the lion is indeed its closest kin. We'll dive deeper into this later on in the video. As for now, there's one question that comes to mind. Why was it so big? Well, somewhere along the way, the American lion not only became its own distinct species, but also grew astonishingly large. Paleontologists estimate that, on average, an adult American lion was about 25% larger than an African lion, but some individuals surpassed even this size. This considerable size difference was due to high sexual dimorphism and variability in size within the species. In fact, some exceptionally large specimens discovered in 2012 suggest that American lions could reach sizes surpassing even their closest rivals, the Smilodon and Panthera fossils. While their impressive size made them one of the most formidable predators of their time, I gotta tell you, it didn't slow them down at all. Yep, despite their mammoth bodies, they were surprisingly fast. Their sturdy bones and long legs enabled them to maintain speeds of over 30 miles per hour, 48 kilometers, which is faster than any human runner and comparable to a warthog speed. Now you're probably thinking, this agility must have made them insanely good hunters. Well, they did pose a threat to all those who shared their habitat but they didn't exactly play the cat and mouse game. The truth is, despite their speed, it's believed that the American lion primarily hunted using ambush tactics rather than chasing prey over long distances. During these ambushes, they would use their retractable claws and powerful bite to take down unsuspecting targets. This method is supported by evidence from recovered specimens, such as Blue Babe, a frozen step bison, which show deep claw wounds and bite marks matching those of an American lion. So it's settled. These ambush predators relied on surprise and precision to capture their prey effectively. Now, what happened to the prey once it got captured? Well, this is where the bite force of the American lion comes into play. It's anyone's guess that it was particularly fierce, thanks to its exceptionally powerful jaws. Also, its thickly built skull allowed it to sink its 4-inch, 10-centimeter-long canines into prey with a force of 1,800 pounds per square inch. This made its bite nearly three times more powerful than that of a modern lion and six times stronger than that of a Smilodon, which had relatively weaker bite force due to its saber teeth. With all of this amazing strength, the American lion could easily immobilize and subdue its prey. Like other modern cats, this one also had conical-shaped teeth. Its upper canines were round and formed a slightly curved cone when seen from the side. 
they fit neatly behind the lower canines rather than sticking out of its closed mouth. And hey, those teeth were exclusively used for consuming meat. Male American lions had canines that were about 20% larger than those of females, and the power of their bite was mainly focused at these larger canines. The now extinct American lion also appears to have been quite intelligent. We know this because of its large brain case and the fact that many living species of Panthera are pretty famous for their intelligence. On top of that, evidence of its intellect can be indirectly observed through ancient tar traps found throughout the United States. These traps ensnared herbivores for thousands of years during the Pleistocene era, serving as a learning tool for predators. Interestingly, despite being one of the most common carnivores of its time, the American lion was rarely found in these traps. In contrast, competing predators like the dire wolf and Smilodon were pretty abundant in these areas. This leads paleontologists to believe that the American lion had heightened intelligence, which must have allowed it to better avoid such traps. In addition to its intelligence, the American lion is believed to have possessed other useful traits shared with its modern relatives, including remarkable vision, smell, and hearing. Paleontologists suggest that its hearing was acute enough to detect sounds coming from well over a mile, 1.6 kilometers away, and its sense of smell may have been even more impressive. It's believed that it could probably detect the scent of prey from multiple miles or kilometers away. These heightened senses obviously made locating prey and navigating its environment a piece of cake for this beast. But then again, it's never really that easy in the jungle, is it? So, what kind of prey did it go after? With its impressive traits and massive size, the American lion was capable of hunting a wide range of prey. Its known targets include deer, horses, camels, tapirs, peccaries, rodents, and steppe bison. Among these, the steppe bison appears to have been a favorite on the menu. We know this through evidence of multiple American lion attacks on them, documented through various specimens. This diverse diet clearly shows the American lion's adaptability and effectiveness as a hunter in its ancient ecosystem. It also had a knack for hunting particularly young, large megafauna, and this liking extended to other herbivores too, like the American mastodon. Paleontologists believe that along with competitors such as wolves, dire wolves, and saber-toothed cats, the American lion posed a serious threat to megafauna populations. In fact, these predators were responsible for up to 17% of all deaths among juvenile megafauna. Their success in hunting these young individuals likely had significant impacts on the dynamics and survival of megafauna populations during that time. It may have also preyed on the giant Colombian mammoth that lived alongside it. However, it's unclear whether it targeted adults or just subadults. This depended on whether it lived in prides or not. Currently, there's no conclusive evidence suggesting it lived in prides. Some argue its large size implies it was a lone hunter, while others believe its nearest living relative, which lives in prides, suggests it did too. If it did live in prides, it would have had a decent chance of bringing down mature mammoths. But even if it was a solitary creature, it still posed a threat to mammoth populations. According to one study, young mammoths experienced a stage where they were small enough for American lions to take down, yet mature enough to wander away from their mothers to forage. Hence, paleontologists believe many mammoths fell victim to American lions during the stage between two and nine years old, when they would have weighed a maximum of two tons. But then again, this window of opportunity for felines was crucial for their survival and hunting success. Now, the American lion's hunting range and habitat were very vast. That was the case because it could easily adapt to various environments. In fact, no other mammal, except for humans, has had such a wide geographical distribution as the extinct lions in the Panthera lineage. It inhabited most of the United States, parts of Canada and Mexico during the Middle and Late Pleistocene periods, with its oldest fossils dating back 340,000 years. Interestingly, it seemed to prefer expansive plains and savannas, avoiding dense forests found in eastern Canada and northeastern United States. These plains and savannas often experienced harsh cold weather, especially during the last glacial maximum between 20,000 to 26,000 years ago. It's believed that the American lions sought shelter in caves during these cold spells and may have lined their dens with grass and leaves. This is a behavior similar to that of the living Siberian tiger. 
and this adaptability to diverse environments contributed to the American lion's success as a hunter and survivor in its time. Despite the chilly environment it inhabited, the habitat of the American lion teemed with life. It coexisted alongside many iconic Ice Age animals, including mammoths, mastodons, cougars, coyotes, black bears, jaguars, short-faced bears, pronghorns, wood bison, longhorn bison, ground sloths, giant beavers, moose, mountain goats, voles, and even glyptodon. Yeah, I think that's enough names before you start to doze off. Anyway, this diverse ecosystem shaped the interactions and survival strategies of the formidable American lion. Moreover, since it was still around 20,000 years ago, it coexisted with humans too, and they may have been one of its primary threats. This idea comes from the discovery of trash heaps containing American lion bones, found alongside Paleolithic human artifacts. This finding has led some to believe that humans were a contributing factor in the American lion's eventual extinction. But this most likely went both ways, because it's believed that it delayed the migration of human beings across the Bering Sea, because it hunted us. Some really well-preserved specimens of the American lion also revealed insights into its fur. Apparently, it had two distinct layers of fur, an outer layer made of guard hairs and a dense undercoat. This dual-layered fur not only provided protection from the cold, but also gave the American lion a reddish appearance that we mentioned earlier. Now, the DNA data extracted from fossil remains is a pretty solid indicator of the American lion's family tree. It turns out that this magnificent beast is closely related to its Eurasian cousin, the cave lion. The story goes back about 340,000 years ago when a group of cave lions found themselves stranded south of the North American ice sheet, likely due to geographical isolation. According to estimates, the common ancestor of the American lion lineage lived around 200,000 years ago, suggesting that it split off from the cave lion before the Illinois glaciation period kicked in. While the cave lion population made its way to eastern Beringia, the American lion remained separate. This way, it maintained its genetic identity throughout various climate shifts, including the Illinoisan and Wisconsin glaciations, as well as the Sangamoan interglacial periods. Interestingly, during the warmer periods, dense boreal forests might have acted as barriers, further isolating the American lion population. Alternatively, there might have been reproductive barriers that prevented interbreeding between the two lion populations. The study also reveals that the modern lion is the closest living relative of both the American lion and the cave lion. Initially, it was thought that the lineages leading to the modern lion and the American slash cave lions diverged around 1.9 million years ago. However, recent genomic research has pinpointed a more specific timeline. It suggests that the lineage of the cave lion split from that of the modern lion around 392,000 to 529,000 years ago. But if you're thinking the American lion may have also had something to do with the more recently extinct Barbary lion, I hate to break it to you, but you're wrong. However, if you'd like to learn more about that completely separate but equally fierce species of lions, you can check out this video of ours. But I gotta warn you, there's a lot of bombshells waiting for you in it. The American lion's existence was first discovered by paleontologists in the early 1800s when parts of its skull were found in Mississippi. A chap named William Henry Huntington was just rummaging around the ravines when he stumbled upon something, well, kinda creepy if you really think about it. It was a jawbone with a few teeth. But this wasn't just any jawbone. It belonged to what we now know as Panthera atrox, or the American lion. Being the curious soul he was, Huntington wasted no time and shared his discovery with the esteemed American Philosophical Society. Later, he stowed away this precious find in the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. But, as is often the case with remarkable discoveries, it took a while for this one to receive its due recognition. It wasn't until 1853 that a certain Joseph Lady stepped up to the plate and officially christened this partial jawbone as Felis Atrox, which translates to Savage Cat. Lady even went a step further and named another similar species in 1873. However, it turned out that this other species was merely a synonym for our American lion, Panthera atrox. Then in 1907, a couple of guys in Alaska stumbled upon a large number of Panthera atrox skulls, and down in sunny California, 
in the famed Rancho La Brea, a sizable felid skull was unearthed. The early to mid-1900s saw a flurry of activity in La Brea, with numerous fossils surfacing, offering us a comprehensive glimpse into the world of Panthera atrox. Initially, it was thought to be a new species within the Felis genus, which includes domestic cats. However, as more specimens were found, it became clear that it was more similar to larger cats. It was then reclassified into the Panthera genus, which includes lions, tigers, jaguars, leopards, and snow leopards. As the decades rolled on, more fossils emerged, stretching the geographical range of Panthera atrox from the sunny climate of Mexico all the way up to the chilly land of Canada. Then, in 2009, a momentous discovery was made, a place called Natural Trap Cave in Wyoming. It turned out to be a veritable gold mine for Panthera atrox fossils, ranking as the second most prolific site. And here's the amazing part. Nestled within these fossil remains was well-preserved DNA, providing researchers with an invaluable window into the past and shedding new light on the lives of these ancient beasts. At first, scientists thought the American lion deserved its own spot in the Pantherinae family. They even gave it a fierce name, Panthera atrox, which basically means terrifying panther in Latin. Some experts were on board with this idea, while others thought it was just a variation of the regular lion we know today, or maybe a close relative of the ancient Eurasian cave lion. But then things got a bit confusing. Instead of being its own species, the American lion got reclassified as a type of lion, specifically a subspecies of the regular lion. However, opinions about its status have gone back and forth over time. When scientists tried to figure out where it fits in the family tree using physical features, it was like trying to solve a puzzle with missing pieces. One study thought the American lion and the cave lion were best buddies with the tiger. They pointed to similarities in their skulls, especially in the part that holds the brain. Another study thought that they were more likely distant relatives of modern leopards and lions. But a recent study took a closer look at the American lion's skull and jaws compared to other big cats. And well, they didn't quite match up with lions. They suggested it might be its own unique thing, separate from lions, but related to jaguars. Another study, though, disagreed, and according to it, it's definitely more lion-like, and any similarity it shares with jaguars are just coincidental. Now, if you're wondering who'd win in a one-on-one -on -one between Smilodon Populator and an American lion, it's likely the American lion would snag the win. And here's why. First off, size matters. Both cats stand about the same height at the shoulder, but the lion is heavier and longer. Then, when it comes to chomping down, the lion takes the cake with a stronger bite. While people often think Smilodon had a monstrous bite, it's actually the lion that reigns supreme in that department. Then there's agility. The lion wins again with its sleek cat-like build and long tail, making it more nimble. Smilodon, with its bear-like body and stubby tail, likely couldn't match the lion's agility at all. And hey, speed, no contest. Smilodon was built for ambush hunting slow-moving prey, while the lion could catch faster game like deer. So yeah, in a fight, the lion's agility and speed give it an edge. But for the sake of being fair, let's not count Smilodon out completely. It had some pretty hefty paws, and its bulky build gave it raw power, though the lion wasn't exactly a lightweight either. Lastly, the lion's missing something, a mane. While modern lions sport that impressive hairdo for protection in fights, the American lion went au naturel, leaving its head and neck more exposed. So yeah, while this can be a close fight, the American lion has the best chance of winning it. What do you think? The exact timing of the American lion's extinction remains uncertain, but the youngest fossils of this giant feline have been dated to around 12,877 years ago. This extinction date coincides with a significant extinction event known as the Quaternary Extinction. The late Quaternary Megafauna Extinction was a massive extinction event that rocked ecosystems worldwide. Climate change and the arrival of modern humans have long been pointed to as the main culprits, but just how much each contributed to the devastation isn't very clear. But what we do know is that many of the large mammal species disappeared from the beginning of the last interglacial around 132,000 years ago up to just 1,000 years ago, and sadly the extinct American lion was one of them. While extinctions are nothing new in Earth's history, 
the speed and scale of this event were unprecedented in millions of years. In the end, there's only one thing left to say. All cats are runners and killers, but the American lion, the biggest cat of all time, could do it all better. Be it humans, horses, or other megafauna, this cat's teeth could cut the jugular right out of them, and with its massive size and robust bone structure, it was for sure a dominant predator of its time and ruled over every landscape that it inhabited. Could any prehistoric creature have gone against the T-Rex? T-Rex fan or not, you'd probably say no. And you'd be wrong. And no, this creature was not another dinosaur, which makes it all the more terrifying. In fact, it was something more than a dinosaur, far exceeding even the T-Rex in weight. Dinosuchus, literally translating to terrible crocodile, was anything but a slow aquatic creature. Despite living in a time period when huge dinosaurs roamed the lands and the seas, this massive beast made all of them think twice before invading its territory. And you can see why that had happened once you take a look at its physical appearance. Estimates of Dinosuchus's size vary, but scientists believe it was between 26 to 33 feet or 8 to 10 meters long and weighed around 5,500 to 12,000 pounds or 2.5 to 5 metric tons. Some huge specimens even suggest it could have reached up to 39 feet or 12 meters and weighed as much as 18,700 pounds or 8.5 metric tons. That's a lot heavier than a T-Rex. Apart from the size though, one of the most striking features was its skull. It was broad inflated at the front and had two holes in the premaxilla, which truly made it unique among its kind. To this day, we don't know the exact function of these holes. As for the size of its skull, it could reach up to 5.5 feet or 1.7 meters long, about the same size as the skull of a Spinosaurus. The teeth were thick and robust, with those at the back of the jaw being shorter and rounded, perfect for crushing rather than piercing. So yeah, it just wasn't built to give its prey a chance. And if Dinosuchus wasn't already terrifying enough, it also had its back covered in large, deeply pitted osteoderms, which are bony plates that provide extra protection. These osteoderms literally made its back look like a tank's armor. All these features made it look a lot like a crocodile, but you should know that it's actually more closely related to alligators Discovery of the brain case of a Dinosuchus shows it belongs to the same superfamily as alligators and caimans, known as Alligatorodia. This means it shares more in common with the American alligator than any living crocodile. But just because everything apart from its brain case makes it similar to crocodiles, we'll compare it to the largest crocodilian alive today, the saltwater crocodile. And trust me, Dinosuchus made it look like a baby. Saltwater crocs are big but they're only about a quarter of the size of the biggest Dinosuchus. And much like its size, everything about Dinosuchus was huge, even its bite force. Dinosuchus had a bite that could make you shiver. And it all makes sense once you look at its skull and teeth in detail. Apart from its skull, which was not only huge, but also super dense and strong, Dinosuchus had 22 incredibly robust teeth, each about the size of a banana, the teeth near the back of its jaws were short, rounded, and blunt, perfect for crushing large bones. Those closer to the rear jaw, though, were shorter and rounded, and weren't used for piercing like the other teeth. This suggests its bite was not only powerful, but also very durable, capable of smashing through tough prey with ease. But what exactly was its bite force? A study claimed Dinosuchus could deliver a maximum bite force of over 100,000 newtons, nearly double that of a T-Rex. This would make Dinosuchus one of the most powerful biters ever. While this bite alone would have been the utter end of many animals, Dinosuchus didn't rely on it alone. For a creature from the Cretaceous, it was quite intelligent, which is obvious from its preying tactics. Dinosuchus was a master ambusher, much like modern crocodiles. It'd lie in wait near the water's edge, ready to pounce on any unsuspecting dinosaur or other animals that came too close. And yes, you heard dinosaur, but more on its diet later. Now once it captured its prey, Dinosuchus would use its immense crushing power to inflict fatal injuries. 
One of the most terrifying tactics Dinosuchus likely employed was the death roll. This move, used by modern crocodiles, involved grabbing onto prey and then spinning rapidly to tear it apart. And unlike some other prehistoric crocodilians like Sarcosuchus, Dinosuchus was well built to handle the stresses of this maneuver. Its strong, robust skull and powerful jaws meant it could perform the death roll without damaging itself. Safe to say, Dinosuchus had every physical advantage possible. Good news for it, bad for every other animal living alongside it. So, let's take a look at its behavior and diet. Though Dinosuchus had a mostly aquatic lifestyle, it likely ventured onto land, especially since it's thought to have preyed on dinosaurs. One of the most compelling pieces of evidence for Dinosuchus's hunting dinosaurs comes from hadrosaurid tail vertebrae found in Texas, which show bite marks matching Dinosuchus' teeth. This means even duck-billed dinosaurs such as Gryposaurus and Critosaurus were on its menu. Even large theropods like Appalachiosaurus might not have been safe, as some bite marks on their bones have been attributed to Dinosuchus. But dinosaurs weren't its only food source. Dinosuchus also preyed on marine turtles, particularly the Borromese side neck turtle, and large fish. Its teeth, especially the robust flat ones near the back of its jaws, could straight up crush turtle shells. This indicates that Dinosuchus had a diverse diet, varying by location. The smaller Dinosuchus in eastern North America likely fed on a mix of marine turtles, large fish, and smaller dinosaurs. The larger Dinosuchus in Texas and Montana, though, might have specialized in hunting bigger dinosaurs, making it the deadliest predator in its region. But the question is, if this croc was so big it could even take on dinosaurs, how was it discovered as a crocodile in the first place? Well, the terrible crocodile story starts way back in 1858, when American geologist Ebenezer Emmons found two huge fossil teeth in Bladen County, North Carolina. No one could have imagined that these would belong to a crocodile because of the sheer size. And so, he mistook the teeth for a pleosaurs, which was a 32-foot, or 10-meter long, apex ocean predator. It wasn't until the early 1900s that things started to get clearer. Fossil osteoderms, which are bony skin plates, were discovered in Montana, but even those were thought to belong to an armored dinosaur called Euoplocephalus. But the real breakthrough came when W.J. Holland put all the pieces together in 1909. He realized these fossils were not from a dinosaur or a marine reptile, but from a gigantic prehistoric crocodile. And naturally, he named it Dinosuchus, literally meaning terrible crocodile. As more Dinosuchus fossils were found in the 40s and 50s, they started to really see how horrifying this predator would have been. The American Museum of Natural History even created a plaster model of its skull and jaw to show what it might have looked like. This model was a bit oversized though, and based more on modern crocodiles than alligators, which is a huge mistake that we'll be talking about in a while. Still, it helped people imagine just how massive Dinosuchus was. Coming to today, scientists think Dinosuchus looked a lot like a giant alligator, but only three times the size of the ones we see today. And if you're wondering how it got to the size it did, you just have to look at its growth rate. Dinosuchus grew at a pretty slow rate, taking about 35 years to reach its massive adult size. This slow growth was tracked through rings on its osteoderms, the bony plates embedded in its skin. These rings are just like the growth rings in trees, showing how the animal grew year by year. It's thought that Dinosuchus got so huge because it lived a long time, not because it grew quickly. This is different from dinosaurs which grew fast, reached maturity early, and had shorter lifespans. This did not mean younger Dinosuchus were to be taken lightly. See, the osteoderms did more than just track growth. They also provided serious armor. These big, heavy plates ran down Dinosuchus' back, giving it great protection from attacks. Plus, they were attachment points for connective tissue, making Dinosuchus strong and able to move efficiently on land despite its size. This armor, combined with its other powerful traits, made Dinosuchus an apex predator, to the point that its presence might have affected the size of other creatures in its environment, especially theropods. In the areas it lived, no theropods grew as large as Dinosuchus. 
This suggests that Dinosuchus was the apex predator, outcompeting other large predators and possibly even limiting their size. Its slow, steady growth allowed it to live long, almost up to 50 years, and dominate its habitat, seeing several generations of dinosaurs come and go. That's also one of the reasons Dinosuchus ruled an entire continent. So next up, we have its habitat and distribution. This beast roamed the Earth around 82 to 73 million years ago during the late Cretaceous period. Fossils of this massive crocodilian have been found across a wide range in North America, showing its extensive habitat and distribution. Dinosuchus fossils have been discovered in at least 10 U.S. states, including Utah, Montana, Wyoming, New Mexico, Georgia, Mississippi, New Jersey, Alabama, North Carolina, and Texas. Some remains have also been found in northern Mexico and possibly other areas, suggesting an even broader range. And in case you're wondering how it spread over such a wide range of habitats, it's actually quite simple. Wherever Dinosuchus went, it had literally zero threat, as shown by its interaction with other species. Given its primarily aquatic lifestyle, it most likely didn't cross paths with many terrestrial animals, unless they ventured near the water's edge. Those that did, however, definitely became prey for this massive predator. Dinosuchus lived in habitats abundant with turtles, such as Boromys, Denizinomys, and Neuranculus. These turtles, along with bony and cartilaginous fish, provided plenty of food in the water, making it unnecessary for Dinosuchus to hunt on land frequently. However, when it did, small Ornithischian dinosaurs were likely targets, and even larger dinosaurs could fall victim if they came too close. In areas like the Kaiparowitz Formation, Dinosuchus lived alongside various theropods. These carnivorous dinosaurs were common, but they didn't pose much of a threat to Dinosuchus due to their size and aquatic advantage. But one of its most interesting potential interactions was with mosasaurs. These giant marine reptiles, some as large as Dinosuchus, shared the waters with the crocodilian. Although no direct evidence of interactions between Dinosuchus and mosasaurs has been found, it's plausible they encountered each other. Both were formidable predators, dominating their respective environments. Dinosuchus also coexisted with a variety of other dinosaurs, like Ceratopsians, Hadrosaurs, and Ankylosaurs. It inhabited regions rich in life, from freshwater lakes and rivers to coastal estuaries, and possibly even ventured into deeper marine waters. All of this just begs one question. If Dinosuchus was so invincible, what exactly happened to it? This terrible crocodile mysteriously vanished about 73 million years ago, well before the mass extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs. But what exactly caused their extinction remains a mystery. Unlike many other prehistoric creatures, Dinosuchus didn't disappear because of a sudden catastrophe. Its size could and could not have been a factor. On one hand, other large predators survived for a long time after Dinosuchus vanished. But at the same time, Dinosuchus wasn't just big. It lived longer, grew slowly, and ate a lot. So even if other predators weren't a fair match for him, they were still competitors for food. Dinosuchus shared its world with numerous other formidable creatures, including large theropod dinosaurs and marine reptiles like mosasaurs. As the populations of these competitors changed, so did the availability of prey and Dinosuchus at some point would have had to ditch its ambush tactics and switch to direct confrontations, which it wasn't used to. Another possibility is that changes in their environment played a role. As the Earth's climate and geography shifted, the habitats Dinosuchus relied on could have changed dramatically. Perhaps the estuaries, rivers, and coastal areas they thrived in transformed in ways that made it harder for them to find food or reproduce successfully. But despite all these theories, the exact cause of Dinosuchus' extinction is still unknown. As paleontologists continue to study fossils and uncover more information, we might eventually solve this puzzle. In the meantime, it's truly amazing how Dinosuchus ruled North America for more than 10 million years. And even though there are a lot of gaps in its story, like the absence of a completely reconstructed fossil or a fully confirmed size range, one thing we do know is it was fierce deadly and terrifying, unlike anything we could ever see. An elephant-sized sloth may be hard to imagine, 
but in a world over 12,000 years old, they were pretty much the norm. Megatherium, literally meaning great beast, lived up to its name in every way. Even though it fed on plants, this massive ground sloth was one of the largest land mammals to ever exist. Stay tuned and you'll see what I'm talking about. Living in a time when the dinosaurs had long disappeared, this colossal sloth roamed the lands of South America and made even the deadliest predators think twice before taking it on. And you'll understand just how impressive it was once you see what it looked like. To start off, imagine a sloth, but not just any sloth, one that's up to 10 times bigger than the sloths we know today. In fact, Megatherium was so huge that it often compared in size to the Asian elephant. This gigantic sloth weighed around 8,000 pounds or 4 tons and stood nearly 7 feet or 2.1 meters tall at the shoulder. Now keep in mind, that's its height when walking on all four legs. If the Megatherium stood up on its hind legs, it would have stood over 20 feet or 6 meters tall. That was its length from head to tail. And in this position, it would have been twice the size of an elephant. But not all giant sloths were this enormous. These measurements are only for the biggest species in the Megatherium family, known as Megatherium americanum. While other species were a bit smaller, they were still pretty huge. Take for instance the Pliocene Megatherium, also known as the Megatherium altiplanicum, which still weighed over 3,230 pounds, or 1.4 tons. But if there's anything cooler than its size, it's the fact that Megatherium could actually stand on its hind legs. This made it the tallest bipedal, or two-legged mammal, ever. Now you might be wondering how on earth an animal this big could stand on two legs. Well, the Megatherium had a strong and sturdy skeleton, with a large pelvic area and a broad, muscular tail. Its body was shaped like a barrel, making it just as powerful as it looked. And that's not it. Even its claws were massive, with the biggest claw, which was found on its third finger, growing up to 20 inches long, or 1.6 feet. As for the rest of the claws, they were slightly shorter, but still pretty long and curved, making them perfect for digging or grabbing plants. Yes, despite its huge size and frightening looks, Megatherium was actually a plant eater. After all, it was a sloth in the end. But Megatherium was a far more advanced herbivore as compared to modern sloths. As you know, Megatherium was mainly a quadrupedal animal, meaning it walked around on all four limbs. But it could also stand up on its hind legs, using its strong tail for balance, just like kangaroos do. This way, it could reach high branches that other plant eaters simply couldn't get to. And since this giant sloth was willing to put in the effort, you can bet it didn't just eat anything. Megatherium's favorite diet would have been plants like agaves, yuccas, and grasses, so it was a picky eater, as compared to other sloths from the same time period. Its narrow cone-shaped mouth and prehensile lips gave it the ability to grasp and handle plants pretty easily, not to mention those long, sharp claws were also perfect for pulling down branches or digging up plants. Plus, the Megatherium had simple but sharply cusped pointy teeth which along with its strong cheek muscles helped it grind up all kinds of plant materials, from soft leaves to tough twigs. As for its social behavior, Megatherium typically lived and foraged in small groups, but some might have lived alone in caves. They didn't have any natural enemies for millions of years, so they likely lived a diurnal lifestyle, which means they were active during the day. Their stomachs were probably quite adapted for processing fibrous plants, but they still needed a lot of time to digest their food properly. This does not mean it spent its days sleeping and digesting food. Unlike modern sloths, which can sleep up to 20 hours a day, Megatherium was generally more active. They spent a lot of time moving around and eating, since it had a high caloric requirement because of its huge size, and in doing so, Megatherium ended up occupying a huge variety of habitats. It mainly lived in parts of South America, but it wasn't just confined to that region. Its range stretched all the way into Central and North America as well. In fact, it got to the point that during the Pliocene and Pleistocene epochs, Megatherium became one of the most common large mammals around. However, it did not hang around in trees like the sloth we see today. Considering its gigantic size, it makes sense that Megatherium spent its days crawling on all four legs. 
As a result, it adapted itself to multiple environments. From grasslands and savannas to dense forests and shrublands, Megatherium could thrive anywhere, as long as there was plenty of vegetation to munch on. However, it was best suited to temperate climates, especially those with open arid or semi-arid habitats. But in the late Pleistocene epoch, things changed a bit for the giant sloth. Its range became more limited, and it was mostly found in the Pampas. This is a huge area of South American grasslands that includes parts of present-day Argentina, Uruguay, and Brazil. In fact, these are the same areas where we first got to learn about the giant sloth. In 1787, a Dominican friar and naturalist named Manuel de Torres found the first megatherium fossil in Argentina. Later on, the bones were sent to Spain where they caught the attention of George Cuvier, who studied the bones using comparative anatomy, comparing them with other animal bones. Cuvier came to the conclusion that these bones were not of a dinosaur or a bear, but belonged to a sloth. Only this particular sloth would have rivaled some of the biggest prehistoric creatures. He named it Megatherium americanum, which literally translates to Great American Beast. Not just that, Cuvier also had a basic understanding of how this giant sloth lived and moved by looking at its skull, teeth, and shoulder bones. He knew Megatherium was a ground sloth and would have used its strong arms to grab onto plants, which is pretty freaky for a sloth. Still, it wasn't the first of its kind. Megatherium was part of a diverse group of sloths known as ground sloths, which belonged to the superorder Xenarthra. The evolution of these creatures dates back to the late Paleogene and early Neogene periods, around 29 million years ago. During this time, South America was an isolated island continent, which gave these sloths a unique environment to evolve in. The family that Megatherium belongs to is closely related to other extinct groups, like the Nothrotheridae and Megalonicidae. They're also related to the family Bradypodidae, which includes the living three-toed sloths we see today. Early ancestors of all sloths were much smaller and adapted to life in trees, with long limbs and elongated bodies, unlike the more robust Megatherium. Over time, some sloths, like the ground sloths, evolved to become larger and better suited to life on the ground. Megatherium, along with its relatives such as Eremotherium and Megalonyx, were among the biggest and most specialized ground dwellers. They developed a more robust body, powerful limbs, and shorter tails, with limbs adapted to support their massive weight. And as time went on, the Megatherium species only grew larger. For example, the rhino-sized Promegatherium is considered a direct ancestor of Megatherium. Then came the oldest species in the Megatherium genus, M. altiplanicum, which evolved during the Pliocene and was the smallest member of its genus. Later, M. torrigensis emerged, which was medium-sized. And finally, the youngest and largest species, M. americanum, evolved about 400,000 years ago, during the Middle Pleistocene epoch. But this is just one species we're talking about. The rest of the ground sloths lived up to 2.6 million years ago, and they were also among the major animal groups that migrated into North America during the Great American Exchange in the Pliocene. However, Megatherium's main homeland was always South America, and for a long time during its evolution, South America remained an isolated island, cut off from other continents. It's this isolation that allowed the giant ground sloth to grow into one of the largest land animals in its ecosystem. Because of its massive size, Megatherium was safe from most land predators for millions of years. However, things started to change later in the Pliocene when the Central American Isthmus formed. This new land bridge allowed much larger predators to move into South America. Megatherium now had to deal with formidable new threats like saber-toothed cats such as Smilodon and short-faced bears like Octodus, but they were tiny compared to the giant sloth, and adult Megatheriums were generally safe due to their size. This also makes sense because the arrival of new species led to the extinction of many native South American animals, but not Megatherium. These giant ground sloths continued to thrive despite the new competition and predators they managed to survive and flourish up until about 12,000 years ago, which means they shared their world with early humans. In fact, there's even evidence that humans hunted Megatherium. Fossils with butchery marks have been found, indicating that humans cut up their meat. 
One notable site in the Pampas region of Argentina shows clear signs that Amigatherium, specifically an M. americanum, was killed and butchered by humans. This is the only known kill site in the Americas so far, but it provides a fascinating glimpse into how early humans interacted with these giant creatures. And from the looks of it, that interaction might have resulted in Megatherium's extinction. Megatherium's numbers dropped from six species in the late Pleistocene to zero by the end of the epoch, and as Megatherium disappeared, so did 80% of other large South American mammals. Some evidence suggests that changes in their habitat played a role. As the climate changed, the areas where Megatherium could live became smaller and more spread out, making it harder for them to survive. And around the same time, humans also arrived in the Americas. One of the earliest known human sites in South America is Monteverdi II in Chile, dating back about 14,500 years. And as luck would have it, Megatherium's extinction coincides with the appearance of special tools called fishtail points, which were likely used to hunt large animals. Considering the size and nutritious flesh of the Megatherium, along with its peaceful nature, it's quite likely that humans hunted it to extinction. In fact, at a site in Argentina, fishtail points were found with burned bones of M. americanum, suggesting humans used the bones as fuel and possibly hunted these giant sloths. There is also direct evidence of humans butchering Megatherium. Two M. americanum bones have cut marks, indicating they were butchered by humans. At the Campo Laborde site in Argentina, a single Megatherium was killed and butchered with stone tools around 12,600 years ago. Another possible kill site in Argentina also has Megatherium bones found with human artifacts, dating from around 11,000 years ago. While the bones were poorly preserved, it's clearly obvious that humans were interacting with these animals. And early humans did not mess around. Even something as giant as the Megatherium would have looked like food to them. It's pretty ironic that these giant sloths could intimidate even top predators like Smilodon, and yet be hunted by humans. Still, Megatherium's legacy lives on as the largest herbivore of its ecosystem and one of the largest land mammals to ever exist. But like all other South American megafauna, this giant sloth also went extinct, with the last Megatherium known to have lived 10,000 years ago. But they did leave behind proof of their existence. Thousands of caves in South America bear the claw marks of these magnificent creatures. So the next time you're around, make sure to check them out. With enormous, deadly sharp canines, this saber-toothed cat is well known as one of the most powerful animals to ever go extinct. But what exactly did it do with those seven inch long fangs coming out of its jaw? Was it an isolated predator or did it live in prides like modern lions? We've got all the answers for you. But first, we must warn you. While Smilodon is related to today's cats, it was sadly nothing like your typical house kitty. So don't be fooled by its furry appearance, because there was nothing cuddly about it. The name literally means deadly knife tooth, but you'll be shocked as we reveal the real purpose behind those finely serrated fangs. Now, the Smilodons often compared to a modern lion in size, but its build was actually very different. These cats were hugely powerful and muscular beyond comparison. They had three different species. Smilodon gracilis or Esphragillus was the smaller one, living from 2.5 to 0.5 million years ago. Smilodon populator, found in eastern South America, was a bigger cat, living from 1 million years to 10,000 years ago. It was hefty, measuring 3 meters in length and standing at 1.25 meters tall. It weighed between 220 to 400 kilograms, making it one of the heaviest cats ever. Its upper canines were incredibly long, reaching up to 28 centimeters. The third and the final species was Smilodon fatalis, or S. californicus, and it was famous for being found in the Rancho La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles. This cat was similar in size to a female lion, but heavier, weighing about 200 kilograms and standing around one meter tall at the shoulders. It lived from 1.6 million years to 10,000 years ago. Now, many Smilodon bones have been found in California, but these big cats roamed freely throughout both North and South America during the Ice Age. Other Ice Age carnivores, like the short-faced bear and dire wolf, 
are closely related to modern bears and wolves, but no true descendants or relatives of the saber-toothed cats survive today. If we talk about its appearance, Smilodon was about the size of a lion, but wouldn't have looked like one. Its body proportions and likely its gait and behavior would have been more similar to a black bear than to a lion. It had massive arms and forearms, a huge chest, relatively short and stout back legs, and grappling hooks on its thumbs. The neck muscles were also much larger than those of modern cats, implying that Smilodon had a pretty powerful bite. Out of the three species, Smilodon populata was the largest saber-toothed tiger, measuring about 3 meters in length, standing 1.25 meters tall, and weighing about 400 kilograms. That is to say, it was a bit larger than a modern-day lion, and much heavier. It had short, muscular legs, and a bobbed tail similar to a modern bobcat. This ferocious cat's powerful front legs were adapted for springing onto prey, but it wasn't very fast and couldn't chase down swift animals like deer. But you'll be shocked to find out what it was capable of hunting. Its skull was 31 centimeters long and had two huge saber-like canine teeth that were serrated and oval in cross-section. Remember Diego from the movie Ice Age? Yes, just like him. Many Smilodon fossils have been found with broken canines, indicating tough encounters during hunts. For instance, a fossil wolf was found with a Smilodon tooth fragment embedded in its skull. Another Smilodon recovered from the La Brea tar pits had a fatal puncture wound from another of its own kind, suggesting they might have engaged in fierce fights. Scientists can also calculate Smilodon's build from fossils, but it's much harder to determine what its skin and fur would have looked like based on modern cats. Their coats could have had various markings designed for optimal hunting camouflage. While they probably didn't have stripes like tigers, if they had any patterns on their fur, they were more likely spots. That's because the environment at Rancho La Brea, where many Smilodon fossils were found, wouldn't have been suitable for striped camouflage. Next, let us introduce you to this cat's insanely flexible jaw. Seriously, you'll be surprised how far these cats could open their jaws. They had the impressive ability to open them up to a whopping 120 degrees, which is far more than today's lions, as they can only manage about 65 degrees. On top of this crazy flexibility, Smilodon's strong neck and jaw muscles enabled them to stab its prey with its deadly maxillary canine saber teeth. However, its jaws were relatively weak due to its long canines and that resulted in a bite strength comparable to that of a large dog and much weaker than that of a lion. It may have used its front incisor teeth to tear strips of flesh from the bones of its prey. Their massive teeth are often compared to a stag's antlers, suggesting they were specialized for killing. Honestly, it's hard to imagine these large canines having any other purpose than piercing thick-skinned prey. Smilodon fatalis was one of the many saber-toothed predators that once ruled the planet. While today's big cats don't have saber teeth, these specialized features have come and gone in ancient mammals several times. It is believed that these long teeth evolved to help the cat hunt tough-skinned prey. DNA analysis of Homeotherium, a cousin of Smilodon, showed it mainly hunted mammoths. This suggests saber-toothed features evolved multiple times to tackle thick-skinned prey. With canines twice as long as homotheriums and a strong body, Smilodon might have specialized in hunting not just young mammoths, but adults too. Research also suggests that Smilodon could shear off flesh from kills using its carnassial teeth. But it's unclear if these cats could survive after losing their teeth. The common belief is that they'd probably die. There's another pretty interesting fact about their teeth. Smilodon cubs have been found in the La Brea tar pits, and analysis of their teeth revealed they were born with serrated milk sabers, just like hyenas. These specialized teeth likely helped them eat portions of a carcass that adults couldn't. It took about three years for Smilodon cubs to reach full maturity, with their adult sabers growing in around one and a half years of age. It's been revealed that their teeth grew at a rate approximately double that of their living relatives, but still took years to fully emerge. This study introduced a new technique combining isotopic analysis and X-ray imaging, which for the first time provides specific ages for developmental events in Smilodon, particularly in their teeth.
The research estimates that the permanent upper canines of S. fatalis erupted at a rate of 6 mm per month, twice as fast as the growth rate of an African lion's teeth. However, the dagger-like canines of the extinct cat weren't fully developed until about three years of age. Now this is pretty darn important for predators like big cats, because for these guys, an important factor determining an individual's full hunting ability is the time it takes for their weapons, which are their teeth, to grow. Now for the real use of these teeth. What good were they? The saber-toothed cat was particularly known for its ability to take down large prey. Its iconic massive canines, the largest of any mammal, were impressive weapons. But scientists have long debated how these teeth were actually used. A new study on Smilodon suggests that despite their size, their bite was surprisingly weak. So, instead of being used for overpowering prey, these teeth were likely precision weapons. They would deliver a single, final wound to a subdued victim, similar to an assassin's stiletto, rather than a swordman's blade, if you know what I mean. Before the study, people had different ideas about how Smilodon hunted. Some thought it used its teeth to hang onto big prey, slash them open, or impale them when jumping. One idea was that it aimed for the throat for a quick kill, unlike modern lions that suffocate their prey. But to really understand how this cat liked to kill, we have to know how strong its bite was. That's what would really settle the debate about its hunting techniques. So paleontologists started by studying Smilodon's fossilized skull. But even then, opinions varied depending on which part of the skull they focused on. Some thought it had small jaw muscles, while others believed its bite could have been powered from the neck. The lower jaw appeared smaller but strongly built, which supported the idea of a powerful bite. In order to get clearer answers, Colin McHenry and his team from the University of Newcastle, Australia, decided to digitally test Smilodon's skull. They used a technique called finite element analysis, which is often used in mechanical engineering and car crash testing. Using CT scans, they made detailed 3D models of Smilodon and a lion's skulls. Because both predators weighed about the same, they probably hunted similar-sized prey. So, they simulated the jaw and neck muscles of both animals and tested their bites on a computer. The results showed that the lion had a much stronger bite than Smilodon in almost every aspect. While the lion could chomp down with a force of over 3,000 newtons, or 300 kilograms, Smilodon managed only around 1,000 newtons. Its jaws were surprisingly underpowered for its size, biting with about the same force as a smaller jaguar or even a dog. But factoring in the powerful neck muscles, Smilodon's bite force increased to a more respectable 2,000 newtons. This tells you that it likely bit from the neck rather than the jaw. Now, even though this helped the Smilodon get a bit of an upgrade in its reputation, it turns out it wasn't much of a runner when it came to biting prey. Unlike lions, which can grab onto fast-moving buffalo without a hitch, thanks to their strong skulls, Smilodon would have been in big trouble if it tried the same trick. Even with a good 200 kilograms of force pushing sideways on its teeth, Smilodon's teeth and skull would have been really strained. Trying to tackle big prey that were still moving would have been risky business, possibly leading to broken teeth or a busted skull. This not-so-powerful bite of the saber-toothed cat means a lot of the ideas about how it hunted are off the table. It couldn't chase after running prey, and if it tried to slash at the belly, it might have ended up with broken teeth if the prey fought back. Smilodon's best bet was to use its teeth to finish off prey that was already caught and couldn't move. It was a one-shot deal, saved for taking down prey that had already been tackled and pinned, preferably at the head. Thankfully, the rest of Smilodon's body was perfectly suited for this kind of hunting. Its build was more like a bear than a cat, and it had extra-large dew claws on its thumbs. These features would have provided enough strength and force to take down large animals in a way that today's lions just can't manage. Lions typically take down prey with a prolonged suffocating bite that can last for as long as 13 minutes. But for Smilodon, once its saber teeth pierced the carotid artery, the fate of its prey would have been sealed in just seconds. Now, which poor animals ended up on the receiving end of these hellish teeth? Well, by now you probably know that Smilodons were carnivores. 
Of course, their big, unique canines are the biggest clue to this. Given the size of their teeth and their strong skeletons, they definitely hunted large mammals such as bison, horses, camels, giant ground sloths, and possibly mammoths and mastodons. Many scientists think Smilodons were ambush predators. They had strong, muscular front legs, which suggests they might have pounced on their prey suddenly and killed them quickly. After tackling its prey with its powerful front legs, Smilodon would use its strong neck muscles to drive its saber teeth into either the neck or belly of its victim. But there's debate among scientists about which area it targeted. Some scientists argue that targeting the belly is risky as it leaves the cat vulnerable to a counterattack, such as a kick from the prey. Additionally, stomach bites with saber teeth typically only cause shallow wounds. On the other hand, a bite to the throat can swiftly paralyze the prey by severing important blood vessels and the trachea while also controlling its movement. So, Smilodon's large canines were likely adapted for making quick kills compared to modern cats. These powerful weapons allowed it to dispatch its prey swiftly and consume its meal without worrying about other predators stealing it. But where was it spotting and hunting all this big prey? Well, luckily for this cat, North America was teeming with large herbivores during the Pleistocene. This provided a massive food supply to hungry prehistoric predators like Smilodon. These cats liked to live in warm climates and inhabited various regions across the American continents. As mentioned earlier, an analysis of isotopes tells us that Smilodon mainly preyed upon undulates like camels, horses, and bison but it also included armored Glyptotherium in its diet. These big cats preferred areas with dense vegetation, likely living in forested habitats. In South America, Smilodon also hunted animals such as Macrochenia, Toxodon, and horses. However, they faced tough competition from other predators like dire wolves, American lions, jaguars, Homotherium, and short-faced bears, which shared their range on both continents. Now, Smilodon evolved and primarily inhabited North America. So when North and South America connected during the Pliocene and formed a land bridge, Smilodon became part of the Great American Exchange. While it's often thought to be the main reason for the extinction of animals like Thylocosmilus and the forest hassid terabirds, this isn't accurate. In fact, Smilodon gracilis lived alongside the forest rassid Titanus and Thylocosmilus and Thylocosmilus went extinct about 4 million years before Smilodon evolved. Now the question is, how did these cats live? Did they live in prides like lions, or did they form packs like wolves? Well, Smilodon evolved to target the biggest of animals in its environment. This meant brute force and killing power might not have been enough. A new kind of killing strategy was required. Bison, horses, camels, giant ground sloths, and mammoths were potential prey. But unless Smilodon hunted together, these giants were formidable opponents. Now, most modern big cats, like tigers, are solitary and hunt alone. Only lions, which live in prides, collaborate to take down very big animals. While there's no definitive proof that saber-toothed cats hunted in packs, clues can be found in the bones at the La Brea Tar Pits. Fossil remains of 2,500 individual saber-toothed cats have been excavated there, outnumbering prey almost 10 to 1. Often, several saber-toothed cat skeletons are found with a single large herbivore's bones, suggesting they were social animals. Some scientists do believe Smilodon lived in social groups, like modern lions. A lion pride typically consists of females living with males, with females doing most of the hunting. Group living provides advantages such as hunting larger game and feeding injured members. And we also have evidence from Smilodon remains at La Brea suggesting these cats could survive severe injuries with the help of their group members. But not everyone agrees with this theory. Some argue that social interaction is rare among carnivores and it's more likely that injured members would be eaten rather than nursed back to health. Which brings us to our next theory that Smilodon may have lived more like modern wolves, with monogamous pairs lasting a long time. This is because, unlike lions, both male and female Smilodons were similar in size and had the same formidable teeth. 
This points to the fact that maybe they didn't have distinct roles, like those seen in lion prides. Finding similar giant canines in both sexes also rules out the idea of these teeth being male ornaments. Now, let's dig into the story of how people first found out about Smilodon. In 1830, a Danish scientist named Peter Wilhelm Lund found and described the first Smilodon populator fossil in Brazil. He called this group of animals Smilodon in 1842. After this first discovery, other similar cats were found too. In 1869, another kind called Smilodon fatalis was dug up in North America by a scientist named Joseph Lady. Then, in 1880, yet another type called Smilodon gracilis was discovered by a scientist named Edward Drinker Cope. It was discovered that these big cats lived pretty long ago and were found in different parts of the world like Eurasia, North America, and South America. Out of these three, Smilodon fatalis is the one most people know about in North America. Lots of them were found in a place called Rancho La Brea in California, where there are sticky pits of tar. Scientists use the bones of these animals to figure out how they are related to the animals we see today. But because the bones are so old, there's not a lot of information scientists could get from them. So, it was assumed that these cats, like all big and small cats, belong to the family called Felidae and the group called Carnivora. An early analysis of the DNA of these creatures suggested they were closely related to modern-day cats like lions and tigers. But recent, more detailed research showed that Smilodons weren't actually close relatives of these cats. Instead, they belonged to a group called Macheridontinae, which is pretty different from the group that modern cats belong to. Now, that's all good, but then how exactly did these cats get wiped off the planet? Saber-toothed cats disappeared along with other big animals about 12,000 years back, during a time called the Quaternary Extinction. Some say it was because of climate changes, or humans hunting them down. Old studies, especially looking at teeth from the La Brea tar pits, made people think these cats had a tough time finding food. They saw lots of broken teeth and figured the cats were biting into bones out of desperation. But a fresh look at the evidence tells a different story. Researchers now suggest something else. Instead of struggling to find food, the saber-toothed cats might have been pretty skilled at hunting big prey, like mammoths and giant sloths. Their big bodies and huge teeth probably helped with this hunting style. Surprisingly, despite their fierce look, their teeth were actually quite fragile compared to smaller predators. This means their broken teeth might have come from hunting, not from chewing bones. These new findings change how we understand these ancient hunters. It tells us that their extinction might not have been just because they couldn't find enough food. Further research on other big predators from the same time will likely give us more clues about why these ferocious cats disappeared. In the end, Smilodon, with its massive size, seven inches long canines, and unique hunting adaptations, stood as a formidable predator of the late Pleistocene era. Despite its eventual extinction, this big cat's legacy lives on through the countless fossils that have been discovered. If you want to check one out, hit up the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for a peek. What modern-day animal do you think would be the closest match to the hunting prowess of Smilodon? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoy learning about ancient creatures, make sure to hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more cool stuff about the past. Around 66 million years ago, the largest snake to ever exist roamed the Earth. Deep in the marshy forests of South America, the lord of the jungle, Titanoboa, was every living creature's worst nightmare. This snake was larger than the T-Rex. It was three times larger than the anaconda, which is the biggest snake alive today. And if you're still not shitting your pants, know that it was as big as a five-story building. Now, if by any chance you haven't freaked out yet, Titanoboa had a killing strategy that'll literally give you chills. What if this humongous beast did not go extinct? What on earth did it eat? And how the heck did it get so huge? Stay tuned, cause trust me, you don't want to miss the answers to these. Now roll the clock back to the Paleocene Epoch, around 66 million years ago, and you'll find that once all the dinosaurs had gone extinct, it was this monstrous snake that became the new ruler of land. 
Titanoboa lurked in the warmest, wettest parts of South America, and humans should feel really lucky they didn't exist back then, because going fishing in Colombia on a nice sunny Sunday could have resulted in the most tragic, gruesome death ever. But before we talk about how this snake killed you, you need to know its true size and appearance. Titanoboa grew up to 50 feet, or 15 meters in length, and it was around 3 feet, or 1 meter wide. This means the thickest part of its body would be nearly as high as a man's waist. Now, the human body can only handle around 770 pounds, or 350 kilograms, without getting completely crushed. But this snake weighed over 2,000 pounds, or 1,000 kilograms, which means it could completely shatter our bones under its weight. You'll be surprised to hear that Titanoboa is more closely related to present-day boa species, rather than giant-sized anacondas. But most paleontologists believe that this massive serpent behaved more like today's green anacondas. That's because it spent most of its time in water to support its enormous size. It had a muscular, legless body, perfect for squeezing the life out of any creature that came its way. Now these snakes didn't carry venom, but their strong jaws and large mouth cavity helped them dislocate and swallow prey whole, even if the victim's body was larger than the snake's head. Titanoboa also had a forked tongue that aided it in locating prey, even underwater. As for its skin, it was so thick that you could describe it as damn near bulletproof. Its color was either brownish or grayish, and that's perfect, as it camouflaged it well in the muddy rivers of the tropical rainforests where it flourished. But what about when it wasn't underwater? These snakes had fairly small scales and really stretchy skin, which made it easy for them to move around on land. Now, all these adaptations were really important because Titanoboa had to share their habitat with other enormous species, like 13-foot crocodiles and 8-foot turtles. I'll tell you more about this later. These massive snakes lived in the hot, tropical rainforests of South America. But luckily for them, they appeared once all the carnivorous predatory dinosaurs, such as Tyrannosaurus rex, were safely dead. Due to their massive size and weight, these snakes likely spent most of their time in the numerous rivers of their habitat. Similar to large sharks or whales, the water would have provided buoyancy for its heavy body. One shocking fact about Titanoboa is that it may have been able to hold its breath underwater for up to an hour. That said, paleontologists have yet to discover any animal brave enough to challenge a fully grown Titanoboa. But on the other hand, this serpent itself took on anything in its way. The only question is, how did it kill its prey? Just like Megalodon, Titanoboa was a solitary hunter as its size allowed it to hunt effectively alone. It would only interact with others of its kind during mating season. It used infrasound to hunt, meaning it was attracted to low frequency noise and vibrations. That made it less likely to attack still or silent prey. But once it did lock onto a target, Titanoboa would go in for the kill, striking and squeezing its prey so tight they couldn't breathe, then swallowing them whole. When dealing with small prey, like humans, Titanoboa could gulp them down quickly without needing to squeeze, but when hunting larger prey of similar size to itself, it would use its immense strength to constrict the prey until it couldn't breathe. And if the Titanoboa ever had to defend itself against a predator, it used its tail like a whip to attack them. Gosh, it'd suck to get hit by one of those. Now let's talk about what these guys ate. While green anacondas are famous for devouring capybaras, pig-sized rodents that love water, along with smaller relatives of American alligators and huge turtles, Titanoboa liked something bigger. In 2012, a life-size sculpture of Titanoboa was unveiled at New York's Grand Central Station. The sculpture showed Titanoboa munching on a crocodile, giving viewers a sense of its enormous size. It was likely capable of eating a much larger relative of the present-day crocodile, called the Dirosaurid. These guys could grow up to 20 feet in length, which obviously means they were massive. And that's a good thing, because so was Titanoboa. It couldn't live off eating smaller prey alone, because that would require it to hunt a whole lot in order to fill its tummy. So, it went for larger prey that it could swallow and then continued digesting it for months. This meant it likely ate three to four times per year. But of course, 
crocodiles weren't the only thing on its menu. In fact, among its favorites was fish, probably a kind of lungfish or bony fish, known as osteoglossomorphs, many of which are extinct today. But when it wasn't dining on fish, Titanoboa may have consumed other reptiles, like turtles. And let me tell you, it was more than capable of taking down even a 300-pound kitchen table-sized turtle. Now that you know how overpowering this gigantic snake was, let's talk about how it became so huge. Firstly, back when it existed, the Earth was much warmer, which made it easier for reptiles to get bigger since their bodies rely on the temperature around them. I'll explain how in a minute. Secondly, Titanoboa mainly consumed large water creatures, like fish and crocs, which were plentiful in its habitat. Of course, having no shortage of food, it could easily grow massive in size. Plus, in a world with lots of big meals and not many enemies, being huge gave Titanoboa a leg up in hunting and getting what it needed to survive. And lastly, the warm weather probably helped its body work more efficiently, making it easier to stay big. Now, just so you know, Titanoboa isn't like the snakes we see today. It belonged to an extinct family of snakes called Metsoidae. Now, if you're thinking, why don't we have snakes as big as Titanoboa in today's South American rainforests? The reason lies in the climate of South America around 60 million years ago. It was much hotter than it is now. This matters because creatures like Titanoboa, being cold-blooded, rely on the environment for their body temperature. Unlike warm-blooded animals that regulate their temperature internally, cold-blooded reptiles can only grow to a certain size before their metabolism slows down too much for them to function properly, especially when it comes to eating. In today's equatorial regions, where temperatures are high, we find the largest snakes. They reach their maximum size given the conditions they live in. To create even larger snakes, we'd need to significantly increase temperatures. Titanoboa likely grew to its immense size because temperatures back then could have been up to 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than they are now. Now this raises the question, could future global warming lead to larger snakes appearing on Earth? Theoretically, yes, it's possible, but in reality, it's unlikely. That's because creating such large snakes would require suitable habitats, which are disappearing due to human activities, especially in biodiverse tropical regions. Other than that, human interference and the rapid pace of modern global warming compared to the gradual warming of the past make it a lot less likely for snakes like Titanoboa to reappear on our planet. But hey, you should be grateful for that, because imagine the roof of your house fell in one day and this massive snake dropped down. What could you possibly do to escape it? Pretty much nothing. If you're thinking you could outrun this guy because it's so heavy, it probably couldn't move fast. Well you couldn't be more wrong. While dragging all that meat around couldn't have been easy for this mega snake, it was really freaking fast for something its size, especially underwater. Titanoboa was capable of reaching speeds up to 50 miles per hour, which is a little slower than a cheetah, but it would have been slower on land, where it actually had to carry its body weight. Now let's talk about where and how this snake was first discovered there's a place in the lowland tropics of northern Colombia, about 60 miles from the Caribbean coast called Carejon. It's one of the world's richest fossil deposits, offering a glimpse into the past when dinosaurs had just disappeared. 60 million years ago, this place was a vast swampy jungle, much hotter and wetter than today. It was full of gigantic plants and animals, including turtles with shells the size of manhole covers, massive crocodile relatives, and lungfish several times larger than those found in the Amazon today. But guess what else lurked in its swampy jungles? Yep, the Titanoboa. And that's exactly where its first fossils were discovered too. In 2009, scientists found the fossils of 28 Titanoboa snakes in the Querejon coal mines in Colombia. They were discovered during an expedition led by Jonathan Block from the University of Florida and Carlos Yaramillo from the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. The name Titanoboa means Titanic boa, and the species name, Kerechonesis, comes from the Kerechan coal mine where the fossils were found. Lastly, one can't help but wonder why this monstrous beast disappeared from the planet. The exact reason for Titanoboa's extinction remains pretty much unknown, but two theories have been proposed. Firstly, 
climate change likely played a role in their disappearance. As global temperatures decreased, smaller snakes became more favorable, gradually replacing larger reptiles like Titanoboa. The rapid cooling made it challenging for Titanoboa to regulate their metabolic processes. Secondly, habitat change also contributed to their extinction. The reduction of rainforests and the emergence of grasslands altered the environment, leaving Titanoboa without suitable habitats. This left them with only one choice, which was to disappear and make room for smaller snakes to thrive. In the end, it's safe to say that Titanoboa stands as one of the most magnificent creatures to have ever roamed the Earth. This colossal serpent, measuring up to 50 feet in length and weighing over a ton, ruled the tropical rainforests of South America and was for sure the Lord of the Jungle. Its sheer size and power, combined with its ability to hunt both on land and underwater, made it the undisputed apex predator of its time. Titanoboa's existence really makes you think how incredibly diverse the ancient ecosystems were. What happens when turtles grow to the size of rhinos? This is the tale of the biggest sea turtle to ever exist. As massive as up to three young humans standing on top of each other in length, this beast had a life you'll want to hear about. Archelon lived in the late Cretaceous period, approximately 100 to 66 million years ago. Its name originates from the ancient Greek words aki, meaning first, and kon, meaning turtle. Its scientific name, Archelon Ischyrus, straight up represents its immense size and power. But what makes this guy really stand out is the fact that it is recognized as the largest turtle species ever documented. Its most substantial specimen measures a remarkable 15 feet, or 4.5 meters, from head to tail and weighs up to 3.2 tons, or 7,054 pounds. Fossils of Archelon have been exclusively discovered within the Pierce Shale Formation in North America. This geographical find tells us a lot about the prehistoric marine ecosystems of that era, like the diversity and dynamics of ancient sea life. But we'll get into its discovery in more detail later. First, we have got to talk about what it really looked like. This massive turtle had a unique hooked beak and powerful jaws, perfect for crushing hard-shelled critters like crustaceans and mollusks as it lazily drifted through the ocean. But what might surprise you is that it did not have a very hard shell like other turtles. The main reason for this was its sheer size. A solid shell at that size would have made the Archelon sink like a rock. So, to counter this, it had dense rib bones and a lighter covering which provided enough buoyancy to prevent sinking, while still allowing control while swimming. The shell would have also had ridges running down its back, adding to its protection against larger predators like mosasaurs. We'll talk about its shell in more detail later in the video. Now, despite its size, the Archelon may have still been vulnerable to attacks, especially targeting its delicate flippers. But there would have been easier prey options for predators, making direct attacks on the Archelon less common. Apart from all these unique features, Archelon also had incredibly long flippers, and yet it's believed they weren't the strongest swimmers. Analysis of their structure suggests they may have been more suited to calmer, shallower waters. However, evidence suggests that it could have managed short bursts of speed, possibly allowing it to catch moving prey or even travel in the open ocean if necessary. Coming to its skull, it was as massive as the turtle itself, measuring up to 3.3 feet long or 100 centimeters. To put it into perspective, that's the size of an adult penguin. It had a long and narrow head with a beak that looked like it belonged to a bird of prey, but with a double-edged twist. The nostrils were elongated and pointed forward, making it stand out even more from other turtles. But perhaps the most interesting feature was Archelon's jaw. When it came to eating, its jaw worked like a hammer, thanks to the articular bone, which was probably cushioned by cartilage. This allowed it to chomp down on its prey with ease. Speaking of prey, let's talk about what this turtle liked to feast on. Archelon was all about the meat. It was a carnivore through and through. Its thick lower shell suggests it spent a lot of time chilling on soft, muddy seabeds, probably munching on slow-moving snacks like big mollusks and crustaceans. Back in the day, there were plenty of giant, thin-shelled bivalves around, perfect for Archelon's dinner table. But as time went on, these snacks became scarce in its habitat. 
but it still had a pretty diverse diet, much like some modern turtles. It feasted on soft-bodied cephalopods like jellyfish and squid, suggesting it had varied predatory habits. With its jaws built for crushing, Archelon likely enjoyed munching on large crabs and mollusks too. The waters it inhabited were rich in thin-shelled shellfish, some as big as four feet in diameter, which would have provided ample sustenance. But Archelon might have also surfaced occasionally to forage for food. Apart from that, near where Archelon lived, there were lots of Neosaurus teeth lying around, hinting that they might have been on its menu too. And just like other sea turtles, Archelon probably hit the beach to lay its eggs. It would have dug a hole in the sand, popped in a bunch of eggs, and then left them to hatch on their own. No parenting for this big guy. We'll discuss how they reproduced later in the video. Young Archelons probably didn't hang around the coasts much, not even during breeding season. The largest Archelon, named Brigetta, is estimated to have lived up to 100 years old. It might have made its end while partially buried in mud, in a state called brumation, kind of like hibernation but underwater. There's been a long-held belief that marine turtles, including Archelons, brumate underwater, just like freshwater turtles. But considering how often they had to come up for air to avoid drowning, that might not be quite right. As for where it lived, fossils found in states like Wyoming and North Dakota, specifically within the Pierre Shale Formation, give us clues about Archelon's habitat preferences during the late Cretaceous period. This giant turtle likely favored shallow sea environments, as indicated by these discoveries. Its ability to generate powerful strokes suggests it was well-equipped for cross-ocean migrations and could quickly get away from other aquatic predators if needed. Its preferred place to live was the northern region of the Western Interior Seaway, which has warmed to mild temperatures. This area was dominated by plesiosaurs, which really tell you about the diverse and competitive ecosystem in which this creature thrived. It was a muddy, oxygen-depleted habitat, with an average depth of possibly slightly more than 600 feet, or 182 meters. The water in this environment likely had a typical temperature of around 63 degrees Fahrenheit, or 17 degrees Celsius. This raises the question of how Archelon reproduced in such an environment. The simple answer is, it didn't. Archelon, much like present-day turtles, came ashore to lay eggs, and that's probably the only time it made its way to the shore. Once laid, these eggs would hatch, and the young turtles would have to navigate through predators to reach the safety of the ocean. With the exception of a few species, most modern turtles follow a consistent nesting behavior of excavating nests to lay their eggs. They typically create chambers in the sand or soil where they deposit their eggs. The female turtle initiates this process by using alternating scooping motions of her back legs to dig the nesting chamber after finding a suitable nesting spot. This nesting behavior is believed to have originated from Archelon. While it may have escaped the water to lay eggs, it still had to head back in there for survival. And that's where trouble was sometimes waiting for it. Archelon was massive, but natural predators like Mosasaurs, Allosaurus, and possibly even sharks like Cretoxyrena were a major threat to it. It was a giant, but predators could still target vulnerable areas like its flippers. However, the sheer size of the Archelon shell might have provided some protection against certain predators. At the very least, adult male Archelons, with their large size and sturdy bodies, would have been more challenging for predators to catch compared to other sea reptiles with slimmer frames. These guys likely used their hardened underside plates as a form of defense. Evidence from bite marks found near fossils also suggests that they may have been targeted by blind predator attacks. So, let's look into their armor and what it does for them in these situations. Archelon's carapace, the protective shell covering its back, consisted of eight neural plates on each side, nearest to the midline, and nine neural plates connecting the midline to the ribs. These plates were mostly uniform in size, except for two pairs. The plates corresponding to the eighth thoracic vertebrae were smaller, while the plate nearest to the tail was larger. Unlike other sea turtles, Archelon had 10 pairs of ribs, and also unlike other sea turtles, where the first rib meets the first pleural plate, Archelon's first rib was noticeably shorter than the second, covering only about three quarters of the length. The second to fifth ribs projected at right angles from the midline and measured an impressive 3.3 feet or 100 centimeters in length each in the holotype specimen. 
its ribs increased in thickness vertically as they moved away from the midline. They were relatively larger and more well-developed than those of sea turtles, originating with a thickness of 0.98 inches or 2.5 centimeters and ending with around 1.6 to 2 inches or 4 to 5 centimeters. The carapace likely featured a row of ridges along the midline over the chest region, possibly totaling seven ridges, each peaking at one or two inches or 2.5 or 5 centimeters. Without a firmly jointed neck and pleural plates, the skin over the carapace was probably thick, strong, and leathery, providing support for the shoulder girdle. Archelon also had osteoclerotic structures, dense and heavy bone formations that likely served as ballasts in life, similar to the limb bones of whales and other deep sea animals. Now that we've talked about its shell in detail, it brings up the question, how did this turtle end up developing that massive carapace? Well, the truth is, the mystery of how the turtle acquired its iconic shell remained a hot topic for over 120 years, until 2008, when a groundbreaking discovery shed light on the matter. A unique 1.3 feet or 40 centimeter fossil found in China unveiled a reptile resembling a turtle, but with only half of its shell intact. This species, named Odontochelus semitstasia, meaning toothed turtle with half a shell, sported a hard shell on its underside, similar to the plastron of modern turtles, but lacked the upper part or carapace. Remarkably, Odontochelus had enlarged ribs, indicating that the bottom part of the turtle shell evolved before the top. Since the fossil was unearthed in marine deposits, one hypothesis suggests that the evolution of the plastron served as a defense mechanism against predators, providing early turtles with protection from threats in their aquatic environment. Coming from beneath in a marine environment, the remarkable fossil of Odontochelus predates Proganochelus by roughly 10 million years, pushing back the origin of turtles to about 220 million years ago. In 2015, another big discovery further enhanced our understanding of the connection between turtles and other reptiles. Papakilis rosi, the grandfather turtle, is a small reptile measuring about 0.6 feet or 20 centimeters, but it boasted significantly enlarged and flattened ribs, distinguishing it from other fossil turtles. Unlike other turtles, Papakilis lacked a shell, indicating it likely represents a transitional form between lizard-like reptiles and turtles, often referred to as a missing link. Papakilis shares similarities with other lizards, such as Unotosaurus africanus, featuring enlarged T-shaped ribs, elongated vertebrae, and a generally round body shape. Both species were terrestrial animals capable of digging. Unotosaurus was first thought to be a turtle ancestor way back in 1892. Nowadays, scientists believe the big ribs on Unotosaurus and Papakilis were more about stability for digging than anything else. They reckon Unotosaurus already had the same breathing setup as turtles, thanks to their sturdy rib cages. Plus, Papakilis' skull looks a lot like other reptiles, showing turtles are probably closer kin to modern lizards and snakes than other extinct reptiles. This idea is now widely accepted among researchers. Later on, after the Triassic period, turtles split into two main groups, the Pleurodires and the Cryptodires. Initially, neither group had the neck retraction mechanisms that are now their most obvious feature. Pleurodires, or side neck turtles, later folded their necks to the side of their shells, while Cryptodires, or hidden neck turtles, pulled their heads back and up into their shells. Both of these methods required complex changes to their neck bones and muscles. Today's turtles are either Pleurodires or Cryptodires. During the Triassic period, turtles protected their necks in various ways. For example, Proganochelus had a collar of horny spikes, while Paleocaris, another late Triassic turtle, had an extension of the carapace. Pleurodires are now less common, mostly found in the Southern Hemisphere, but they were once widespread both on land and in the waters around the coasts. Sea turtles and soft-shelled turtles both cryptodires are found worldwide. Santanachelus, a cryptodira from the early Cretaceous, had large salt glands under its eyes, essential for excreting excess salt from its seafood diet. In earlier times, turtles had movable metacarpal and short digits on their feet, similar to land turtles. Later on, these toe bones lengthened and became encased in flesh, and the feet evolved into flippers as sea turtle diversity exploded during the Cretaceous period. Some cryptodires even began an evolutionary journey back to land, 
Modern tortoises are descendants of sea-dwelling turtles, not directly from older land turtles. The specific changes involved in this transition aren't well documented, but many turtles returned to being toe walkers, and their shell ornamentation and shape varied greatly over time. Coming back to the Archelon, its impressive size and unique adaptations, such as its star-shaped plates for achieving neutral buoyancy, hold great evolutionary significance. These traits not only helped this creature thrive in the varied marine environments of the late Cretaceous period, but also offer valuable insights into the evolutionary transition from ancient creatures to modern sea turtles like the leatherback. Studying its features provides us with a window into the past, shedding light on the evolutionary processes that have shaped the development of sea turtles over millions of years. But how was this beast of a turtle first discovered? The Archelon sea turtle was first unearthed by American paleontologist George Reba Wieland in 1895. He stumbled upon the holotype specimen, the very first fossil of its kind, within the Pierce Shale geological formation in South Dakota. Wieland made this remarkable discovery along the shores of the Cheyenne River in Custer County. Interestingly, the specimen he found lacked its skull. But in 1897, another individual stumbled upon a fossilized skull of the turtle in the same area. Then, in 1902, yet another complete specimen was uncovered along the Cheyenne River. In more recent times, significant discoveries of Archelon skeletons have taken place in South Dakota in 1992 and North Dakota in 2002. The 1992 find was particularly notable as it yielded the largest specimen known at the time. This specimen, affectionately named Brigitte, was discovered in Oglala, Lakota County, South Dakota, and is currently on display at the Vienna Natural History Museum. All in all, these discoveries have greatly enriched our understanding of Archelon and its prehistoric environment. Of course, scientists have been able to classify this beast based on the fossils too. It is classified within the reptile class Reptilia, the order Testandines, the suborder Cryptodira, and the extinct family Protostegidae. And while it may resemble other sea turtles, Archelon doesn't share ancestry with any living or extinct species. In fact, its evolutionary path within the Protostegidae family is pretty unique, setting it apart from other sea turtles. As to what caused its extinction, it's speculated that as the seaway gradually moved southward, Archelon may have struggled to migrate along with it. And so, the increasing presence of new marine or mammalian species posing a threat to its eggs and hatchlings could have contributed to its extinction. The disappearance of giant protostegids coincides with the rise of democolids, suggesting a shift in the marine ecosystem. Protostegids, including Archelon, are notably absent in Maastrichtian deposits, the latest Cretaceous period, likely due to a cooling trend. This cooling may have affected other turtles as well, but some species managed to survive, thanks to their thermoregulatory capabilities. It's estimated that average water temperatures dropped to around 45 to 54 degrees Fahrenheit, or 7 to 12 degrees centigrade, depending on CO2 levels. However, there is some evidence suggesting that Archelon might have persisted into the Maastrichtian period. Fossils from the Maastrichtian age Kansas Pierre shale deposits could indicate that Archelon survived longer than previously thought, possibly enduring millions of years into the Maastrichtian era. In the end, only one thing remains to be said. Archelon stands as a majestic symbol of the prehistoric world. It offers a peek into a bygone era when giants roamed the seas. Its colossal size, reaching up to 15 feet in length, truly makes it the king of the turtles. With its leathery shell and powerful jaws, Archelon likely navigated the depths of the late Cretaceous waters in search of prey. All of its fossils that have been recently pulled out give us remarkable insights into the prehistoric marine ecosystem. It's quite amazing how despite being beyond huge, this turtle was still not invincible in the scary waters of South Dakota. It faced challenges from predators like mosasaurs and sharks. Yet, its resilience and evolutionary adaptations tell you about the incredible diversity and survival strategies of ancient marine life. Today, Archelon's fossils serve as invaluable treasures, offering clues to understanding the mysteries of our planet's distant past. As we continue to explore and uncover the secrets of our natural world, Archelon will forever be the most amazing turtle that once lived beneath the waves. Have you ever wondered what would happen if you mixed a dog and a bear? You'd get one of the biggest predatory mammals ever. Something exactly like this. Meet the Amphicyanids. 
they're quite literally called bear dogs, and for good reason. While it wasn't a cat, dog, or bear, this animal looked a bit like all of them. Around 40 million years ago, these strange creatures were roaming all over North America before they slowly creeped into Europe. But where did they even come from? And are the cuddly little dogs in our homes today an evolved form of these ferocious creatures? You'll be surprised by what you find out. But let's start with their appearance. Bear dogs had a dog-like snout and tail, but a bear-like body. They were part of a diverse group of ancient meat-eaters that dominated the Northern Hemisphere for over 30 million years. Some were like foxes, others were fast hunters, and some, like Amphisaion, were almost as large as polar bears. They varied greatly in size, ranging from as small as 11 pounds or 5 kilograms to as large as 220 to 1,700 pounds or 100 to 773 kilograms. They evolved from wolf-like to bear-like body forms. These guys were the ultimate predators, feared for their vicious teeth that could tear flesh apart. Their jaws were built for crushing bones and ripping through muscles, armed with sharp fangs and jagged molars. And these guys were scary enough to make even the toughest rivals tremble at their sight. The ancient bear dogs we're talking about today were impressively large. They towered over their surroundings, with a size similar to modern grizzly bears. Standing up to 1.5 meters or 5 feet tall at the shoulder, they were formidable creatures, similar in size to a 70-inch flat-screen TV. But what made them so darn dominant that they became one of the rulers of the prehistoric world? Well, they had an extremely powerful skull for one. These skulls were built to handle the pressure of biting and tearing apart prey. Bear dogs also featured wide necks, similar to that of a bear. Overall, their bodies were pretty stout and robust, with massive limbs and flexible shoulder joints and wrists. Now, let me shed some light on their hunting tactics to give you a clearer idea of what I'm talking about. These guys were big-time predators, and their hunting style depended a lot on their size. They could go after all sorts of prey, from small mammals to large herbivores. And given their size advantage, they could easily overpower and conquer their prey forcefully. Their bodies were strong and muscular, especially in the chest, shoulders, and legs, which helped them grab and control their prey. Now, even though they were big, they could move surprisingly fast and change direction quickly, which made them pretty good hunters. But other than that, these guys also came with really thick fur that kept them safe from the harsh weather and any harm while they were hunting or fighting. This fur also allowed them to keep their body temperature steady throughout the year. It acted like a coat, keeping them warm during cold weather and helping them stay cozy. So, in this way, this fur was a crucial adaptation that helped them survive and thrive as predators. But it wasn't just for warmth. It also provided insulation, protection, and likely some water resistance, allowing them to survive in different environments across the ancient world. These animals resemble bears a lot, particularly because they had snouts that were big and extended just like bears do. But they also had one very important function. Their strong jaw muscles attached easily to these snouts, which gave them an insanely powerful bite and strong grip strength. As far as their senses go, bear dogs had their ears positioned perfectly on the sides of their heads for hearing sounds such as those made by other predators or potential prey. Of course, good hearing would have been crucial for successful hunting and avoiding danger. The design of Amphisaion's teeth reflected their carnivorous diet perfectly. They had strong jaws, packed with teeth. The long, pointed teeth were ideal for grabbing and piercing their prey's flesh while helping them hold back and immobilize their victims at the same time. Moreover, their molars, along with their canines, were serrated, which allowed them to tear through tough hides and crush bones. These dogs also had pretty sturdy limbs, which provided them with the support and mobility required for the predatory lifestyle they liked to live. They needed to be able to move swiftly and forcefully while chasing their prey, and that's exactly what those limbs were made for. Their front legs had some incredibly powerful muscles, ending in paws that were equipped with sharp claws. These claws were used in seizing and gripping onto prey, overpowering their victims or defending against other predators. 
Apart from that, these razor-sharp claws could dig into various surfaces, like soil or uneven ground, providing stability during pursuits or securing a firm hold on struggling prey. But of course, if they were to catch a running meal, they needed to be fast in the vast jungle. So, bear dogs relied heavily on their hind limbs for those quick bursts of speed. And luckily for them, their powerful legs provided just the force needed for fast sprints, allowing them to chase prey and dodge threats. Now to address the question I posed in the start of the video. Are these ferocious bear dogs the ancestors of the cuddly dogs in our homes today? Well, the answer is no. You can stop giving your pup the side eye now. The thing is, despite being called the bear dog, Amphicyon did not directly evolve into either bears or dogs. It belonged to a group of mammal carnivores that came after the big creodonts, but before the first true dogs. I'll talk about their evolution and family tree in more detail later in the video. Now that we've got this out of the way, let's talk about the social behavior these animals exhibited. Bear dogs likely did not hunt in packs like modern wolves. Instead, they probably avoided competition with pack hunting predators and scavenged for food, such as the carcasses of deceased animals like Calicotherium. Their large size and strength may have allowed them to prey on slower or weaker members of herds, such as elderly, sick, or juvenile animals. However, these guys most probably did not rely heavily on hunting tactics like pack coordination. We believe these animals exhibited solitary behavior, with females looking after their young. They were probably aggressive territorial creatures that used vocalizations and scent to mark their territory and communicate with others of their kind. Now, obviously like all other mammals, amphicyanids also engaged in sexual reproduction, with males and females interacting during mating. There may have been a specific breeding season, a time of year when mating and reproduction happened more frequently. During this season, these animals would have engaged in courtship rituals to attract mates and form bonds. These courtship behaviors involved displays of dominance, vocalizations, and even physical interactions to check the fitness of potential partners. But since we don't have much evidence, it's hard to know exactly how long females were pregnant before having babies. As for their habitat, Many amphicyon species lived in forests where they could hide and hunt among the trees. These forests were full of herbivores that made easy targets for these bear dogs. They often chose to roam across grasslands because those open areas were perfect for hunting moving targets. Some of them chose caves for shelter. These caves provided protection from bad weather and other dangers. So, inside them, these animals could stay safe and raise their young. Now let's talk about the evolution of bear dogs. During their peak, these animals played a crucial role in outcompeting other groups of early dominant predators, which are now extinct. By eliminating these competitors, the bear dogs made way for their own relatives, the carnivores we're familiar with today. Yes, the tale of carnivores could never be complete without acknowledging the forgotten role of the bear dogs. Most of today's meat-eating mammals, such as cats, dogs, and bears, belong to the carnivora order. While it might seem like being in this group means only eating meat, carnivora actually consists of animals with various diets, from bamboo-loving giant pandas to omnivorous creatures like raccoons and even walruses. While a carnivore is any animal that eats other animals, carnivorans are a specific group of placental mammals, and among the earliest carnivorans were the bear dogs, which first showed up in the fossil record about 40 million years ago, during the Eocene Epoch. They likely started out in North America and later moved into Europe before the continents split apart. Fossils suggest that two different groups of bear dogs evolved separately for millions of years. One of the earliest known species, Daphoenus demilo, lived in North America during the late Eocene. It lived in dense forests, eating plants and small animals. Like all bear dogs, it belonged to the California group, which also includes modern bears, dogs, seals, and skunks. Scientists think that bear dogs split off early from other caniforms, creating their own branch on the mammal family tree. Even though bears and dogs came along later, they're the closest relatives of bear dogs today. And because of this close relationship, bear dogs share a lot of traits with both of them. For example, they often had longer, pointier snouts like dogs and bears, 
and many were large-bodied and walked with their feet flat on the ground like bears, yet they also possessed a long dog-like tail. Once the North American bear dogs were cut off from their Eurasian relatives, they went their own ways in evolution. In North America, they divided into two groups, and both had a big impact on how predators and prey interacted. The first group shows up in fossils around 40 million years ago, mostly in places like Texas and Wyoming. For a long time, it wasn't clear where amphicyanids originally came from, but recent studies suggest they might actually have originated in North America from ancestors called Miasis cognitus and M. australis, which are now named Gustafsonia and Angeloctocyon respectively. Since these ancestors are from North America but look like early amphicyanids, it's possible that the Amphicyonidae family started here. The most recent Amphicyonid remains found are teeth in northern Pakistan, dating from 7.4 to 5.3 million years ago. But with these fierce animals now long gone, the real question is, what wiped them off the face of the earth? We think the decline of bear dogs was due to changes in their environment during the Miocene epoch. As the climate became drier, their prey, such as horses and camels, evolved to become faster, making ambush hunting more difficult for bear dogs. Additionally, they faced stiff competition from other predators. Bears emerged as formidable competitors, being more adaptable due to their ability to eat plants. Saber-tooth cats also posed a threat, specializing in ambush tactics and possessing unique killing weapons. But perhaps the most significant challenge came from dogs. Dogs grew larger, became more social, and were even faster than bear dogs, making them better suited for survival in changing environments. This shift from an arms race to a leg race further disadvantaged bear dogs. Ultimately, the onset of the Pleistocene Ice Ages brought about drastic environmental changes, which contributed to the extinction of many species, including the amazing bear dogs. In the end, bear dogs were formidable carnivores that were quite dominant in their time. In fact, they were one of the largest predators back then, and with their powerful jaws, robust bodies, and dense fur, they were extremely well adapted to hunt and survive. Even though they've gone extinct, it'd have been amazing to domesticate one of these guys. But then again, nobody wants their real dog eaten for dinner by their other pet. So, maybe not. That's all for this video. Who do you think would win in a fight against the bear dog? A Rottweiler or a grizzly bear? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoy learning about ancient creatures, make sure to hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more cool stuff about the past.